In the frigid obsidian depths of the waters off the coast of Somalia, my team of Navy SEALs and I embarked on a mission that would demand every ounce of our training, resilience, and courage. The day etched in my memory was 2023, and our mission was nothing short of dismantling a notorious pirate network wreaking havoc on international shipping lanes. I belonged to SEAL Team Bravo a brotherhood of elite warriors whose diverse skills had been meticulously honed through years of grueling training. Among us was Lieutenant Michael Raptor. Thompson, our seasoned and battle-hardened leader with a wealth of experience gained from multiple deployments, our intelligence revealed that the pirate mastermind, codenamed Blackbeard, orchestrated his operations from a coastal village turning it into a hub for planning and executing hijacking. Our mission directive was clear. Infiltrate the village, neutralize Blackbeard, and extract invaluable intelligence on the pirate network. Under the Shroud of Darkness, we approached the shore in silent, specialized boats, the moonless night providing the cover we needed for the element of surprise. Tension hung in the air as we neared the beach, each member of the team laser focused on the imminent task. Upon reaching the shoreline, we silently disembarked, moving with the stealth and precision that defined our training. Navigating through dense vegetation, we evaded enemy patrols, strategically placing reconnaissance devices to gather real-time intelligence. As dawn's light began to stain the sky, SEAL Team Bravo reached the outskirts of the village. Through night vision goggles, we observed the compound where Blackbeard supposedly hid. Huddled together, we finalized our plan, reinforcing our commitment to the mission and each other. We breached the compound with controlled aggression, swiftly and silently clearing rooms as we advanced toward our target. The air crackled with tension as we encountered armed guards, engaging in close quarters combat with the efficiency of a well-oiled machine. Bullets pierced the air and the echoes of grenades reverberated through the compound, but we pressed forward. In a climactic moment, Lieutenant Thompson confronted Blackbeard in a room filled with maps, weapons, and stolen goods. A fierce firefight ensued, each shot amplifying the high stakes of the operation. Thompson's training took over, and with calculated precision, he neutralized the pirate leader. With Blackbeard incapacitated, we secured the compound, seizing documents, computers, and communication devices that held valuable insights into the pirate network's operations. As we exfiltrated, destruction trailed in our wake, rendering the pirate network inoperable. Back at the extraction point, SEAL Team Bravo regrouped. Silent boats whisked us away into the ocean's depths, our identities and actions shrouded in secrecy. The success of the mission stood as a testament to the unwavering commitment of my fellow Navy SEALs, who executed our duty with precision, courage, and an unyielding sense of purpose in the face of danger. I was talking on my cell at the end of my sidewalk by the street when I turned around facing my house and saw this huge black human-like bird thing gliding without a noise coming from the east. Maybe the distance would be like three streets over, but about maybe five blocks down. When I saw this, I was stunned and stared at it, trying to figure out what it was, and then I realized it wasn't anything I've ever seen. I ran into the house and yelled at my husband and my grown son to get out here quick. They came but seemed like forever, and they looked and saw it too. When they saw it, the thing was like the a few streets over and then disappeared behind the big trees. When we saw it, we all said that no one would believe us, but I have recently been talking about it because it has bothered me so much. I've lived in this neighborhood all my life, and I can remember three UFO sightings since I was five, and all the sightings were in this neighborhood or around Stinson Field Airport. I never came forward about them because people think you've lost your ever-loving mind until recently when others I've spoke with shared their experiences. 
I have other stories, but this one is the most recent, and I was wondering if anyone has ever seen this thing. It is silent like it was a glider, but I could see the body was exactly like a man, a very large man. I live in Sweden, and a few years back, I uh, lived with my parents, whose house is in a small village in the middle of the woods, so there is plenty of wildlife around. It was in the middle of the winter, and pretty much the whole village had gathered at a hut down by the lake to grill and have a nice time. It was about 8 p.m., and it was dark as shit, and I wanted to go home and play Skyrim, so I left and began the two-kilometer walk home only having my phone to light the path. After one kilometer, I heard something. It was a deep panting. It was way too deep to be a neighboring dog, and I remembered someone mentioning earlier that wolves had been seen near the village. I tried to keep my cool and kept walking in the same pace, trying to spot whatever was running a few meters away from me, breathing loudly, but the light was too weak to spot anything. At this point, I was freaking out a little inside and picked up a large tree branch and carried it with me like a weapon, just in case. The thing ran beside me for a hundred meters, then disappeared. When I hadn't heard it for a few seconds, I ran as fast as I could the few hundred remaining meters. I never got to know if it was a wolf, Bigfoot, crawler, or any other cryptid or not, because it began to snow soon after covering the tracks. Then after checking with the neighbors, I know it wasn't a dog. That's probably the most scared I've ever been. I encountered a huge, brilliant red light while finishing my rounds as a security guard. It hard above some trees near a construction site. Curiosity compelled me to investigate further, leading me closer to the site. There, I discovered a large saucer-shaped object with a hump in the center-bottom section, surrounded by a vibrant red light. As I approached, a low whirring sound reached my ears, and the object descended, landing on a tripod-like gear. To my surprise, a stairway, like protrusion, extended towards the ground. A figure emerged from the craft and began descending. The humanoid stood at an impressive height of eight feet with long, dangling arms, a massive torso and short, stump-like legs. Its face was elongated and oval-shaped with two tear-shaped eyes that captured my attention. An eerie sensation gripped me as the creature moved towards me with high, loping steps. I felt a strong humming inside my skull and caught a whiff of an odor reminiscent of rotten eggs. Just then, a passing car on the road behind me caught the creature's attention. It abruptly retreated and swiftly boarded the object, which rapidly took off and vanished into the sky. Randy Morganson was an experienced backcountry ranger, having worked 28 seasons in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He was intimately familiar with the High Sierra wilderness, having explored it more than any other ranger. Dedicated to his job, Randy took his responsibilities seriously. On a summer day in 1996, Randy left a note on his tent, stating that he would be away for two or three days. Strangely, the date on the note was June 21st, not July 21st. Carrying only his backpack, he departed from near Bench Lake, leaving behind his smith and Wesson 350, 7 Magnum at camp. Unfortunately, Randy never returned, and he was never seen alive again. Randy Morganson was one of many seasonal rangers who had been reapplying for their jobs every summer, with no medical benefits or retirement plan. They were a tight-knit group, referred to as the Fourteeners, as they had been returning to the park for over a decade, some even for two decades. Their reward was not monetary, but rather the beauty of the sunsets they witnessed. If a ranger were to die in service, their family would receive a one-time payment of $100,000, but no pension. Randy had written in his 1973 McClure Meadow Log, expressing his longing for adventure and the freedom to find his own path. 
Randy's life took a downturn as the 1996 season approached. His wife, Judy, decided not to join him on backcountry adventures after he had an affair with a fellow ranger named Lawlinus. Randy's spirits were low when he questioned the worth of his job after years of service. The divorce papers from Judy arrived, adding to his emotional burden. Randy's friends noticed his mood decline, and he confided in them about his thoughts of S. Then, on July 20, 1996, he contacted his colleague and his wife on the radio, asking trivial questions. Their conversation abruptly ended with Randy stating, I won't be bothering you two anymore. The next day, Randy left his camp without a trace. The community was haunted by the mystery of Randy's disappearance. The circumstances left many questions unanswered. Was it an accident? Foul play? Or something more inexplicable, like an encounter with aliens? The search and rescue efforts were relentless, with rangers scouring the area for any sign of Randy. The search leader utilized a computer program called CASI, computer-aided search information exchange, to track the effectiveness of each segment search. However, weeks passed with no leads, and morale began to decline. The rangers were determined to find their beloved colleague before it was too late. Ranger Rick Sanger, a second-year backcountry ranger, hiked through the night to Randy's duty station at Bench Lake. There, he discovered a note confirming Randy's overdue status from a cross-country patrol. Anxiety grew as everyone wondered what had happened to their veteran mentor. The investigation into Randy's disappearance uncovered two separate threats of violence made against him. However, neither person had an alibi for the time of Randy's disappearance, leaving the case without a clear suspect. Speculation ran rampant. After 13 days of searching, hope started to dwindle. Then, in a remote gorge five years later, a worker stumbled upon fresh evidence. It was a breakthrough. Rangers were summoned, and they discovered Randy's shirt bearing his badge, his backpack and a boot half submerged in water. Excitement turned to horror when a leg bone was found in the boot. The evidence matched Randy's reported gear. Despite the discovery, the search for answers continued. Retired Sierra Subdistrict Ranger Alden Nash believed that Randy had stumbled through a fragile snow bridge and fallen into an icy abyss, breaking his leg. He theorized that Randy's body remained hidden beneath the snow for days while search parties combed the area. Judy Morganson received a letter after Randy's disappearance, but it arrived two days later. This added confusion to the mystery. The search for Randy yielded no definitive answers, leaving his family and colleagues yearning for closure. Randy Morganson's fate remains a haunting mystery. Speculation and theories abound, but the truth eludes everyone. Despite the page of time, the unanswered questions surrounding Randy's disappearance linger, forever reminding us of his enigmatic vanishing. A few years back, I lived in Arizona. I would always travel to Tucson, Mesa, and Flagstaff, but spent most of my time living in good old Phoenix. While down near Tucson, really close to San Xavier Reservation, I was wandering in a small town and stayed near the edge of the town so I can take in the view of the bare desert during the day. I was much younger than I am right now, so this might have been just my imagination, but I don't think so. My imagination wasn't that visual and messed up while staring into the night of the desert to take a quick leak and get back on the road. I got done draining the lizard and tried to take in the view of pitch. Black Valley eliminated by passing car lights in the starlit sky. I would look into the desert when a car passed by and would gaze into the distance for a split second. Nothing came up and I didn't think anything would. The Arizona Valley was something I've always been used. That being that, the darkness of the desert was nothing to fear for me. After about the tenth or eleventh car passed, I spotted something in the distance that caught me off guard, and at first, I didn't pay any mind to it. I was curious and waited for a car's light to light up some of the distance. Now, of course, cars didn't eliminate the whole valley, only about fifteen, twenty feet or twenty, thirty feet. 
so whatever I saw was pretty damn close, way too close for comfort. I stayed for another car to pass, which felt like five minutes, which was only ten seconds in reality, after the a couple cars passed to light up my vision. Fifteenth car speeds by, holy as I think to myself after realizing what I saw wasn't just my mind messing with me. I saw what seemed to be a person walking alone. It would throw me off if it was a regular guy wandering in the dark, but what really messed with me was how it walked and looked. The only way to describe his, or hers, or whatever the F it was, was like a cripple or a mentally handicapped person that has been in a wheelchair all their life trying to walk, stumbling and waddling, dragging their leg ever so often. From what little I made out of, its facial features made me cringe and shudder, making my stomach drop to my ass. Its face seemed to be male. Its jaw was disfigured, and the face was ghastly skinny and empty. Big eye bags that made its eye sockets look empty, mouth wide open that also looked hollow. Other physical attributes I made out was that it had no claws, deathly skinny, tall, and I mean freakishly tall and incredibly dirty, probably looked white. From how dirty it was, I would thought it wasn't even human. After I've seen all I needed to see, I noped the F out to there, hopped back into the car, and went on with my night. Wasn't able to sleep that night because I couldn't help get curious or think about it, not sure what the F it was. Maybe I was straight tripping that night, but it seemed way too real to be my imagination or random hallucinations. And for the record, there aren't any homeless people just wandering the desert in the dead of night with no claws on that I've seen or heard of. But please give me your thoughts and tread on this post. If you think it's bullshit, I don't blame you. But I swear it was as real as possible. I grew up in rural southwestern Ontario, and our property was flanked by trees, and then it was 100 acres of corn. One summer evening, we were playing hide-and-seek with some friends and family. I was hiding near a pine tree about 50 meters from the road, waiting until I could avoid the person who was it. I was the last person and could see everyone else waiting for me on the porch, yelling to hurry up so we could start the next round. Suddenly, I hear what are clearly footsteps behind me, and I bolt, assuming it's my cousin, who is it trying to tag me. I sprint across the yard and make it to the porch, only to realize he is on the opposite side of the house. We suddenly hear or see car lights as it starts up and peels down the road. I have no idea why someone would get out of their car, walk 50 meters through the corn, but I was certainly spooked and assumed they had malicious intent. My parents were all into the supernatural and said it was a ghost, which in retrospect seems like a retarded thing to say to a nine-year-old child. But whoever it was gave me a scare that I still won't forget. I was 40. One years old, out hunting in a remote and appropriately named area, when something truly bizarre caught my attention. There on the ground was a dark purple object the size of an 18-wheeler, resembling a bat wing. It had a drawbridge-like door that stood open. Nearby, I spotted three creatures engaged in trying to capture an alligator. These beings wore what seemed like golden crowns, had human-like faces with long hair, and possessed sharp lion-like teeth. They donned breastplates resembling cast iron. The most astonishing aspect was the presence of four wing-like protrusions and scorpion, like tails on each creature. Initially, the creatures were unaware of my presence. However, when one of them spotted me, I quickly reacted and fired my 12-gauge shotgun. The shot hit one of the creatures in the chest, knocking it down momentarily. But astonishingly, it swiftly got back on its feet and retaliated by firing some sort of implement that dangled from its waist. The beam-like light struck my wrist, leaving behind a scar. Unfortunately, the incident resulted in the loss of most of the functionality in my arm. 
Undeterred, I fired another shot, prompting the humanoids to rise into the air and retreat back inside their object. The door closed and the craft took off at an incredible speed. From that day forward, I vowed never to hunt in those woods again, forever haunted by the unnerving encounter. I consider myself a very analytical person, not easily swayed by something I see or feel. This is the reason why it took me so long to write this up. And if you read my earlier post, you would understand. This happened in October of 2017. It was right around 5 p.m. I was just doing my daily patrol through a farming community close to my station that was mostly abandoned after sunset due to trespassing, theft, and mischief. After making rounds checking empty buildings and barns with little to no activity, I headed back towards the main road about 500 meters from where I started off. At as I got closer to the paved asphalt of the highway, there were farm fields on each side of me as far as my eye could see. To my immediate right was a large pumpkin field that had mature pumpkins, and although the ones closer to me were ripe, I noticed some green ones on others further in the distance. I slowed down quite a bit when I saw this so I could take a better look at them just in case there might be someone trying to steal them. Although it was getting dark, it wasn't quite sunset yet. As I got closer, just within the 30 meters of these pumpkins, something caught my attention. It was similar to when you catch movement out of your peripheral, but when you look over, there's nothing there. So naturally, I've been in countless situations in which I've had to defend myself or apprehend someone. I immediately slowed down, put my cruiser in park, reached for my flashlight, and grabbed the pepper spray on the passenger side. As I was reaching for these items, I noticed something very small crawling across this large rock next to the pumpkins. At first glance, it looked like a little misshapen little man. It didn't seem to have any gender or sex, nor did it appear to be an adolescent child due to its size. Before stopping, shifting into reverse and backing up, the creature apparently sensed me somehow and quickly scampered off behind the pumpkin towards a thicket of trees. The whole thing happened so fast that all I could do was put the car back in drive and proceed back to the station. When I got home, I decided to try and look online for what this might have been. I came across this subreddit. Now, months later, after counseling through an officer assistance program, I feel comfortable being able to talk about it without feeling like I need somebody to watch over me 24-7. It had to have either been a gnome, a troll, or a goblin, as ridiculous as it sounds, made even admitting that they're real. I hope that by posting this, maybe another fellow officer will read this and open up about some of the more sensitive things in their own life. I was partnered with a fellow officer who would always tell me these stories about how he was seeing this thing all over the place. He said he saw it by the 7-Eleven and then again by an abandoned house that used to be a meth house. Finally, this thing had apparently followed him outside of town into the swamps and forest. I never once thought he was making any of it up because you know he's my partner. That's not his style. He's very serious. But I began to notice things along with him as well. At first it wasn't anything major, but just odd little things that you'd see for a split second, usually when you're driving through unpopulated rural areas at nighttime. Other officers had told me that they too had been seeing something strange around their patrol zones, but were hesitant on speaking up. One night, my partner said that he was going to follow whatever it was into the forest. I was already nervous about the area of Florida because people have talked about seeing some really weird things there in the years. I tried talking him out of it, but he insisted on going anyway, so I went with him. A few blocks away from the edge of the forest, I told him to stop and park by a remote two-story house on a street corner. He parked right next to it, cut his engine off, and we sat there in silence for roughly three to five minutes. Then we heard this blood-curdling roar coming from nearby in the marshes, and my partner looks behind us and screams, Oh no! 
Then he turns the engine back on and peels out of there like a bat out of hell. I never did find out what he saw behind us. I didn't find out until after he'd retired that he'd seen what was making those roars, and he claims it wasn't human. I hope the department never puts him in a position to have to shoot one. I can only assume they're big, tough, and mean, but again, if there were anything like this when he saw it, who knows how much good a gun would. Do, if this is maybe something like a skunk ape, I'm also willing to bet that all the strange creatures out there are smart enough to not attack him after what he must have done. That's all for now, folks. But if you want to discuss this in private, go ahead and send me a PM. I'd be more than happy and willing to discuss this. This story was shared to me probably a little over a year ago by a U.S. Border Control agent who obviously wanted to remain anonymous. Some of the stories he shared with me about working on the southern border were interesting, including some Bigfoot-type encounters. But the first incident that he experienced was with a dogman. This occurred when he was still training for his job. It really shook him, because he had never seen anything like it before. So, he drove around with a senior co-worker, a field training officer. They were in their Ford truck driving around, showing him the checkpoints and hot spots where they usually find people illegally crossing the border. I believe he said he was working 10 or 12 hour shifts. This was at the Arizona, California border where it intersects with the Mexico border. One night, while he was still fairly new, he actually had a cold and wasn't feeling very well. They were traveling on a dirt road which was part of their normal routine. They didn't see any signs of people, which they thought was a little odd because he says he always sees trash, water bottles, or clothes, or something out there. They got to the turnaround and flipped on their spotlights. They didn't really see anything, and as they're turning around the headlights and the spotlights illuminated something in the distance, his training officer looked over and said, Oh, that's probably just a wild animal. We should we go take a look. They get closer, and I guess at this point the terrain got kind of rough. He slowly drove forward. While observing this animal, they could tell that it had dark black fur, but weren't sure what they were looking at. Maybe we should just leave it alone. He was really urging the training officer that they should get out there. His response was, no, we need to go check it out. Then it clicked with the training officer that something wasn't right. It looked like a bear hunched over while eating something. They got within 30 yards of it, a good distance, but still close enough that they could see what was going on. At this point, they flipped on another set of bright lights from the light bar on the cab roof. This creature lit up, then it stood up. He thought it was a giant man with a fur coat, but as it turned around, he noticed that it had this dog's head like a wolf's head. It was all black, and you could see the eyes. The eye shine was reflecting an amber tint. It was very muscular and had broad shoulders. It was way too huge to be a dog or a wolf. Then it stood up on its back legs. He immediately stopped the truck as they watched this upright canine looking at them. After several seconds, this dogman eventually took a step towards them. Then it took another step, and it was closing distance. It wasn't walking fast, but its strides were so huge, and it was getting closer and closer. He threw the truck into reverse. The dogman opened its mouth a little bit and hunched over like it was sizing up prey. He quickly turned the truck around and drove away from the creature. He looks in the rearview mirror. He could still see the dogman illuminated by the red rear lights. He said he had never seen anything like that. It scared the crap out of him. They directly drove back to the station. His training officer said that it was just big dog, but don't talk about it with anyone. They didn't mention it in their nightly report. Occasionally, you'll pick up migrants that will talk about the Lobos or the Big Hairy Man and other strange stuff in the desert. Me and my girlfriend at the time went camping deep in the Everglades. We took a dirt road off the Tamiami Trail at the 40-mile bend and headed straight south, 
into Big Cypress Preserve. After passing a few strange private properties, an old Volkswagen full of mannequins, 15-foot fences with no trespassing signs, etc., we found a campsite that was part of the preserve about 30 minutes later. We set up camp, and my girlfriend points to a tiny overgrown trail leading back into the woods. I grab my machete, start clearing the path, and start hiking along this old trail with her right behind me. We probably blaze that trail for about a mile and a half before she stops me. I look up, and there's this old double-wide trailer a few yards off the trail up ahead. The walls and floor had mostly fallen through and was totally destroyed. After looking through it, we kept walking. I'm looking down, hacking away with my machete, and she stops me again. There was this small cinder block shelter off the trail to the right. By this point, I'm getting creeped out trying to figure out the logistics of someone building a shelter of cinder block or bringing a double wide that deep into the woods. We were miles from any roads, and we were in a swamp. It just didn't make sense. We kept walking see more shelters, and all of a sudden the woods open up into this clearing. The shelters we had been seeing surrounded the clearing making a circle, and there were old 70s style clothes on the ground, old bottles and cans, and different small tools in each shelter. We turned around, looked up, and saw these two H-beams raised on a series of pillars, making a railroad track that traveled above the brush from way off in the distance, and ended at this site. Thoroughly creeped out, we started to circle back toward our campsite before I hear my girlfriend call me over. There was a single-engine airplane with bullet holes down the side turned over in the brush. We checked out the plane and got the hell out. About two years ago now, a friend and I were driving around some dirt roads in rural Georgia, miles out from any civilization we were just driving because he had plenty of gas, and we were bored. Anyways, we turn off the road, we were on to check another road, and as soon as we're on it, standing right in the middle of the road, dead ahead of us, about five yards from the gate, is a massive white cat. We're talking mountain lion size but fluffy like a bobcat and snow white of course my reaction was to ask him if he was seeing what i was seeing because what i was seeing was a giant albino bobcat after about five whole minutes of making sure we were on the same page and not hallucinating during which it just sat there naturally we pull a little closer to get a better look at it the thing just stared at us so we go to get out of the truck as soon as we opened the doors, it trotted to the other side of the gate and stood there continuing to watch us. Like it knew, we were completely foiled by that gate. We still go out at those woods a few times a year to try and find it again, but it has been to no avail since. Still an amazing experience we'll never forget, though. Eight years ago, I found myself in Bend, Oregon, a place that seemed to harbor whispers of the unknown. As I explored the charming town, I stumbled upon an intriguing tale that would ignite my curiosity and lead me on an adventure I could never have imagined. I had the chance to strike up a conversation with a lady who had camped near Paulina Peak, a majestic peak that stood tall at 7,897 feet. The thought of camping amid such breathtaking scenery excited me, but it was her story that truly captured my attention. She recounted a night eight years prior when her peaceful camping trip took an unexpected turn. In the early morning hours, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the wilderness. The sound was like nothing she had ever heard before, and it sent shivers down her spine. Frightened and perplexed, she decided to share her experience with the local Forest Service Rangers from the Descutes National Forest. The Rangers were attentive as she described the terrifying scream she had heard. They revealed to her a plaster cast of a Bigfoot track left by a creature that had been spotted crossing a road by two of the Rangers themselves. 
With conviction, they assured her that the scream she heard was probably from the very creature that left that intriguing track. Intrigued and captivated, I was eager to learn more about this mysterious encounter. I sought to track down the retired ranger who had witnessed the Bigfoot track, hoping to hear more about this enigmatic creature roaming the woods of Oregon. However, my efforts to follow this lead were met with obstacles. The Forest Service personnel seemed tight-lipped, unwilling to share any further information. So basically, I was with a group of friends walking from one condominium to another. There was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with one of my friends. We were walking through a slighty dark part of the street in Sun Delhi. Both of us saw some, some white thing in one of the trees. It looked like a slime, and it was moving in a really weird way had no legs, no face, and it was a really powerful white, like there's no chance it was a light or something else. I called for the other guys, and as I shouted, it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way, as if I scared it. I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it, but honestly, I was scared too, and my heart started beating fast. So I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, because we talked later, and both of us saw the same thing, and even complimented each other as we talked, so I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course, none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said. Some of them got intrigued, but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you. It was really strange. It was like that venom slam, but white. It's my only encounter with something that I just can't explain what it was. It really looked like it was not from Earth. My husband bought me a voodoo doll a couple birthdays ago in New Orleans. It was a vampire to keep you safe at night. I thought it was cute but I did not put too much stock in it being real. Anyway, fast forward to a couple weeks ago. For some backstory, my husband was a Boy Scout. He has no fear of the wilderness and is strictly a don't worry until you have to person. We had been camping for several days at this point, so I was not spooked either. It was a very normal, happy night. When we arrived at this campsite, I got the idea to grab our vampire. We normally keep him hanging in our car. He would not budge. I'm talking my husband, and I both tried to get this clip to open for a good ten minutes, and it just wouldn't. We thought maybe it had melted together in the heat, joke that he needs to stay in the car for some reason we are unaware of, and we went about our day. Fast forward several hours, we are in our tent at Sipsy Wilderness, with our kids just hanging out after they went to sleep. With no prompt. No scary rustling in the bushes. No bad feeling. Nothing. I get the urge to ask my husband if he's scared. I suddenly feel my hair standing up. He says yes. Without even talking to each other about what we should do, we both instantly grabbed the kids and ran for what felt like our lives to the car. Tossed the still sleeping kids in the back seat, my husband buckling them in the car as I'm driving away. I'm big on car seat safety, but I didn't even wait. I just had a feeling we had seconds to get out of there. We didn't even get a chance to discuss what was going on when a random car passes us, leaving the empty campsite. This is 2 a.m. in the freaking remote wilderness in nowhere Alabama. The entire campsite was empty that whole day. I just drive faster at this point, leaving all our belongings behind. We arrive at the closest Walmart, maybe a 30 minutes drive, and the employees are outside. Walmart is closed. Seriously, there are about 10 employees outside just staring blankly at our car. If anyone has an explanation for this, please let me know. It was eerie, but this may not be anything. I guess there might be overnight stalking where 10 employees are taking a smoke break or something at the same time, but it just seemed off. We parked in the lot away from the employees as not to spook them, but they just kept staring. They didn't speak to each other or move. I decided to keep driving. 
I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I had no idea what to do at this point, so we just kept driving around and napped in the car with keys in ignition, ready to book it if we needed to until the sun came up. We returned to the campsite, packed our stuff as fast as we could, and we never went back. We have since spent all our camping time at Chia with no instances like this one, the weirdest part. That next morning, my husband tested our voodoo doll clip, and he came right off the car immediately. It's almost like he refused to leave our car that night to keep us safe. This probably doesn't explain everything the way it actually happened to us, but in summary, we got a really weird urge to run. Saw some weird stuff. And now I'm afraid to go back to Sipsy. What do y'all think? So I was hunting with my dad up in the mountains a few years back, and we had called it a night and returned to camp. After more than a few beers and some whiskey, we went to bed. Now we weren't sleeping in tents or anything, just some ancient army cots under the stars. After dosing off, I hear our old ice chest open and then thud shut. And that old ice chest had a very loud and squeaky hinges, so it was very noticeable. I assumed it was my dad getting a water bottle. A few seconds later, it happens again and repeats a few more times. So I turn over to ask my dad how is he so drunk that he can't operate an ice chest to find he's still asleep and snoring next to me. I reach for my mag light and shine it on the ice chest to find a black bear rummaging through it. He takes one look at me and runs off with something while I yell at him. Later the next day, we find the bottle of Crown Royal a few feet away from Camp Unopened. We always share a laugh about that alcoholic bear. I was staying at a cave hut in Wales on my own once and had a pretty creepy experience. I stay at very remote cave huts a lot, but never before on my own. This cave hut is huge. It used to be ten terraced miner's cottages, and has dozens of bunk rooms and common rooms downstairs. It's utterly remote, and it doesn't have any curtains or blinds, so there's no way of telling if anyone is looking in the windows when it's dark. Not that that's very likely, given the remoteness of the place, but I did get a shock when I saw the glowing eyes of some sheep looking in the kitchen window at me. There's no phone reception, no neighbors, and it's halfway up a Welsh mountain, there is a payphone in the conference room, but it's supposed to be for emergencies, cave rescue callouts, etc. And I didn't even know how to turn it on. This place is so creepy that they used it as a set for one of the episodes of Torchwood. Countryside, the episode about the cannibalistic Welsh villagers. I'm a fairly rational person, but I was definitely getting myself a bit worked up once it went dark. The sheep incident particularly scared the bejesus out of me. But the bit of the hut I find spookiest, apart from the curtainless windows, is the bunk rooms upstairs, because the hut was converted from ten cottages. There's no main hallway either upstairs or downstairs, and all the rooms connect in a rambly, circular sort of way. Most of the bunk beds are triple height, so there's pretty much no way to see all of a room at once, and the lights go off on a timer. I picked a bottom bunk in a room that had double-width bunk beds and went to bed early. I'm woken up at about two by very loud banging coming from the radiator pipes, which are right by my head. I initially panic but convince myself that it's either the heating coming on or else another group of cavers has arrived very late and are having showers or cooking. Due to the size of the place, there could well be another group that I hadn't heard arrive. So I go back to sleep. About an hour later, I'm woken up again by more banging, but this time it's more like wood on wood, and it's coming from the ceiling. It's almost like someone wearing boots, stamping on the wood of the attic floor above me. This time I nearly shit myself. The only thing that stopped me leaving the room was the thought of all those spooky dark bunk rooms outside my room. Eventually it stopped, and somehow I went back to sleep. It's only when I woke up the next morning that I realized that there was no way the pipe noise could have been the heating, because it's never turned on. No other people have arrived overnight either, 
so that rules that out. That morning, a few local calvers come up to the hut, and I get talking to one of them about what I heard. He tells me that he had a similar experience in that room. He's a very superstitious person and instantly accepted that it was a ghost or similar in the attic. I'm much more skeptical. So he decided to go up into the attic and investigate what was up there. Even though I'm a skeptic, what he said next sent shivers down my back. The attic room up above that room is not boarded, meaning that there's no way a ghost could have been stamping on the floor in the attic. So the only rational explanation, in his opinion, was that it was actually stamping or banging on the ceiling of the bunk room, the bunk room I was asleep in. I've never stayed at that hut alone again, and I've never slept in that particular bunk room. Yet it, sorry this turned into a bit of an essay. I'd forgotten just how scary this particular experience was. I grew up on about ten acres. Not big, but with other people's property having acreage around me. It was a lot bigger of an area nobody was around. It was all wooded, too. Well, besides, two acres for the house and yard. Anyways, I'm like five playing outside, and my neighbor and his friend walk over. They were roughly thirteen and came over all the time to see my brother and sister. They walk up and say, Hey, you know something's in your bushes, right? Confused and curious, we walk outside expecting a normal deer or elk to walk out. Nope. A man walks up all bloody, high as shit, middle of the day. We all run inside, lock the doors, and try and hide so he doesn't see us, as we call 911. The police eventually come get him after he breaks a glass door panel and almost gets in. I'm still scared of the dark. Even though I'm a mother, I'm not afraid to admit I'm scared of the dark from it. My brother always made jokes about it growing up. A few buddies and I decided to drive from Colorado down to Arizona one year. Since there were four of us, we decided to just leave in the evening and drive through the night so we could be in Arizona by the next afternoon. So we are making decent time headed through New Mexico and start to realize the gas is a bit low and we haven't really seen anything for a while. Usually you see at least a sign every couple miles telling you how far it is to the next set of stores, gas stations, or fast food places, but we haven't noticed any and the tank is getting super low. Finally, we saw one random sign indicating that there is a gas station about a mile off a pull off a bit ahead, but we are all a bit stressed because the needle is basically below empty this point, and we are in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. Literally just pitch black, but you can see the outlines of the low hills from the moonlight. Not too freaky, but whatever. So we pull off at the exit that the sign says and drive away, which felt like a lot more than a mile, basically now wondering what the hell we are going to do if we run out of gas if we are off the highway. We finally see a light up ahead and can tell it's a gas station. But as we pull up, we notice a few weird things. First, the only lights are the street lamp next to the gas station and the fridge lights inside at the back of the gas station convenience store. No indoor lights, nothing else. And of course, the fridge lights are like old yellowish. Creepy is hell lights that those old fridges have. It's clearly a very old gas station. Only two pumps, no prices, and just had an extremely weird vibe about it. Finally, the creepiest thing about it was that there were four cars in the parking lot. Older model sedans and a pickup just sitting there. No lights, nothing else. We pulled up to it and paused in the street, just sitting there, and I think all four of us just knew we should not get out of the car and that we should leave immediately. The combination of the eerie gas station the four parked cars with none in sight, and the creepy New Mexico rolling hills just creeped all us out. Without any of us saying a word, we flipped a U-turn and headed back to the highway, praying that we at least made it that far in case we needed to hitchhike to get some gas. By some miracle, we made it up the road. 
another couple miles to another pull-off with an actual big-name gas station. Somehow we ended up pumping more gas than the car's manual indicated it had capacity for, and even at that gas station there was some creepy trucker just sitting at the pump next door, watching us from his cab. In the Appalachian Mountains, August of 1990, I, 17-year-old Jamie, decided I needed an adventure. With a heavy heart and a desire to escape, I sneaked away from my home in Minnetoa and embarked on a bus ride bound for Florida. However, halfway there in North Carolina, a change of heart led me to retrace my steps and head back home. Unfortunately, the next bus wouldn't depart for two days leaving me stranded with no place to stay. Determined to make the most of the situation, I decided to camp out in the Great Smoky Mountains. Equipped with a bull whip and a machete, I felt prepared to face the wilderness and any wildlife I might encounter. Little did I know that what awaited me in those dark woods was something beyond my wildest nightmares. In the dead of night, around one, one thirty in the morning, a terrifying sound jolted me awake. Instinctively, I grabbed my bullwhip, scanning the area for any signs of danger. The noise grew closer, and my heart pounded with fear as I noticed shadows moving in the bushes. Then my eyes met the creature's, its eyes a sickly yellow, unmistakably monstrous. My adrenaline surged as I realized I was being hunted. My fear was overwhelming, but I knew I had to defend myself. The creature's reptilian appearance, with ridges on its head and talon, like hands, sent shivers down my spine. I snapped my bullwhip at it, but to my horror, it effortlessly snatched and destroyed it. Panic overtook me, and I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. Desperate to create distance between myself and whatever nightmarish being lurked in those woods, with my heart still racing, I sought refuge by diving into a cold mountain stream, hoping to put some distance between me and the creature, uncertain if it could swim or not. As I emerged on the other side of the river, I continued walking for hours, my mind reeling from the traumatic encounter. Eventually, fate led me to cross paths with a Cherokee native man. Exhausted and bruised, I mustered the courage to ask for a ride back to the bus station. As we drove, he saw the state I was in and inquired about what had happened. I hesitated, wondering if I would be dismissed as crazy. After a long pause, I decided to share my harrowing encounter with the creature in the woods. To my surprise, the man didn't dismiss me or question my sanity. Instead, he spoke with a quiet knowing and simply said, You're lucky you only ran into the one. Let's go! There was no need for further explanation. We both understood the inexplicable nature of what I had faced. In the safety of his presence, I reflected on the encounter that had forever changed me. I couldn't help but wonder about the mysteries hidden within the vast expanse of the Appalachian Mountains. Mysteries beyond our understanding, perhaps best left undisturbed. I had sought adventure, but what I found was an unimaginable terror that would haunt my dreams for years to come. So I spend a lot of time hunting and fishing in some of the more rural areas of North Carolina. I've seen graveyards that date back to colonial times in central to western parts of North Carolina that you would assume were too far from the coast to be settled. I have had experiences in houses that predate the 1890s as far back as we can trace. That would definitely make you believe in ghosts, but the strangest and most frightening experience I have had was when I witnessed what I could only assume to be ball lighting last bow season. Last year in September, my brother, his girlfriend, and myself moved into a nice older house that is on 13 acres of property. Being avid bow hunters, the first thing we did was hang a ladder stand on the most obvious deer trail and drop a corn pile and camera nearby. Flash forward to mid-October. We've been seeing a good amount of deer on our camera and are super excited to take turns sitting in the stand. 
One afternoon, my brother and his girlfriend are leaving to visit her family that lives just a few miles down the road. I decide to take the opportunity to hunt. The leaves are falling and everything is orange in the woods. Right at dark, in the fleeting moments of legal shooting light, I hear the unmistakable sound of deer moving towards me. What I mean by unmistakable is that deer typically walk so cautious they barely make any sound at all, often stepping G lightly enough that you would think it was an animal much smaller in size until they break a branch. It's the trained ear aspect that other hunters would be familiar with. It's getting darker and darker, and typically I would climb down, but these deer are shadows right on top of me now. I hesitated because I didn't want to alert them in hopes of coming back and catching them in the act earlier at some point in time. I'm watching these sleek long shadows when, bam, all of a sudden, the woods lights up with this glow. In retrospect, it's hard to describe exactly what happened or what I saw, but it looked precisely like what a lighting bug looks like in the distance, except on a much larger scale. A bright green flame-like ball the size of a dinner plate, hell, maybe even bigger, just lit up four feet off the ground right underneath me. I waited for the deer to explode through the woods, but airily they didn't. As a matter of fact, they vanished almost like transported, just gone. They light itself only illuminated for a few seconds and then complete darkness. Needless to say, I waited another three hours for my brother to come looking for me, pulling up in his truck, worried. There was no way I was leaving the safety of that tree stand until someone came and I wasn't alone. Ha! <sighs> Crazy! My brother passed away about seven years ago on March 22nd. Sometimes I have visitation dreams from him where we sit and talk. I hadn't had one in a while. Back in late March of 2015. Not on the 22nd. I happened to have another one. In the dream, we were sitting somewhere talking. During the dream, he put his hand on my shoulder, and at that moment I woke up. I realized I had to take a leak. So I got up, walked into the bathroom, switched on the light, and looked in the mirror. On my arm, where he had touched me in the dream, was a large bruise, and right above it was his first initial written in pen, just above the bruise. I don't have any pens in my bedroom, and I'm not a sleepwalker, and I'm not on any medication. The bruise didn't hurt at all and faded within a few days. I have no idea how to explain what happened. My heroin addiction hit rock bottom back in May or June of this year. I ended up not being able to pay my rent, so I pawned off almost all of my possessions, and before I could piss every cent of it away, I decided to buy some basic camping supplies. A tent, a fire starter, parachute cord, knives, snare wire, etc., because I knew it would be impossible to live out of my car in the summer heat. I ended up doing a kind of hybrid thing where I would spend a few days out in the woods, then go back to my car to pawn some more of my shit and score dope or food. The point is, I was wandering off into the woods at night without any real idea of what I was doing. I would usually try to go a mile or so and so that I wouldn't be in as much danger of being on anyone's property and getting arrested. However, this was harder than I imagined it would be. The woods near the trails I grew up wandering, which had acres of land separating them from any homes, had become a victim of the McMansion developments that sliced into forests all across the nation. So I would often find myself in an area I thought was desolate, only to realize that there were houses one-eighth of a mile or so away. Whenever this happened, I was always afraid some kid would go running into the woods to play in the early morning see me, and then rush to his parents, who would undoubtedly call the police about the six-feet-two unshaven stranger sleeping on their property with two giant knives, military-grade, rope, and snare wires. Like I said, I didn't know what the F I was doing, so I often found myself hiking through the woods long after nightfall, swinging my machete blindly and struggling to assemble my tent with one hand. 
while I held my phone's flashlight in the other. That is, until I pawned my iPhone, too. It was one of those nights. Well into the evening by the time I set out, and I had tried to make it a point to go much further into the forest than usual, due to the aforementioned fear of being caught near those housing developments. I finally decided I'd hike far enough. I was looking for a large open clearing that used to spook me as a kid, but now seemed like the ideal place to set up camp. Looking back, I'm guessing it was a grow-up, but at the time, the abandoned minivan with creepy words spray-painted on the side, filled to the brim with peat moss, was rather unsettling. The woods were very dense, so clearings were difficult to come by, and I had to take what I could get. Unfortunately, I had no luck finding the place, but by the time I was certain I'd gone too far, 11-12, I figured at least I was far away from the housing developments to not have to worry about the cops. I was shining my phone's flashlight around, and I spotted a very small clearing a few hundred feet from the trail. I went over to it and realized it was a fairly thick patch of moss on top of a rocky surface. I figured it would have to do, so I struggled and cursed my way through the process of setting up a tent in the pitch-black night. It was almost 1 a.m. by the time I finally lay down to sleep. At first, I was on my side, facing right, but when I tossed over to my left, four inches of moss is hardly a temper pig, and the withdrawals weren't making my situation any better. I saw something strange. Through my tent, I was able to see a single point of light in the distance. I couldn't quite tell the source or where it was, but my first guess was that it was a flashlight on the trail, since it was definitely bright enough for me to have seen it when I was setting up camp. As I stared at it, however, I noticed that it didn't seem to be moving. That meant that whoever's light it was was either standing still or else moving parallel to my eye line. I continued to stare at it, and it continued to remain the exact same size, which meant it wasn't moving towards or away from me. I stared at it for five minutes, and the only thing I could come up with was that it was a backyard porch light for one of the newly built houses. Thing was, as I stared at it, I got the impression that it was moving ever so slightly, just barely enough to pick up on. After a half an hour of this, I convinced myself that I must have not noticed the house due to the time I arrived, and I was content enough with that explanation to be able to fall asleep. However, when I woke the next morning, just as I had originally thought, I was in the middle of nowhere, probably a mile from the nearest house. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.